The following program is brought to you by Caltech. I'm very much looking forward to Dave Johansson's talk about the days of <laughs> synthesis. Synthesis, there you go. There you go. An excellent title. Thank you. And uh, I, I was asked to talk about the 10 most intense years of my life in 15 minutes. So I wrote it out. So I apologize for that, but I just didn't want to miss stuff. Um, I met Carver when I was an undergraduate freshman here. Um, it was in the W department because we didn't have a CS department yet, but that was coming. Um, I took two of his classes the first year. One was uh, the design of a simple calculator, and another was uh, program logic arrays. And they were very interesting classes. Uh, but the best was yet to come. At the end of that year, I asked Carver how to design an integrated circuit. Um, I wanted to build a guitar tuner for my girlfriend, who's now my wife. Um, and he handed me a couple of books. But he said I should take the 281 class um, the next year. And I explained to him, well, that's a graduate level course, and I'm going to be a sophomore. Um, he looked at me with a very blank expression, and he said, so what's your point? <laughs> um, and it turns out he was right. Uh, that was the best class I ever took. So much better than AMA 95. Much better than <laughs> AA 115. Um, since I was local, I was going to be looking for a summer job. And um, he offered me a position fixing and calibrating electronic equipment down in the electronics lab, and also designing a CMOS version of some of their homebrew test equipment, uh, the DigiWidget. So I did that, and that was a lot of fun. But that next year, things really got rolling. Uh, I was got absorbed in chip design stuff. And we spent all our days doing stuff like this, drawing pictures um, on graph paper. I always walked around with uh, five marking pens in my pocket, one for each color, one for each mask layer. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't have the pocket protector, luckily, because although I saw that would have been bad. But um, that was also the year we were starting the computer science department. And we were working on the Lambda design rules and all this stuff. It was, it was a very exciting time. But drawing these pictures was just the first step. We next had to have the computer plotted out very accurately on the film so we could actually make the chip. Um, at the time, we were using the, department, uh, the school's IBM 360 mainframe computer for generating these, these plots. We'd submit our jobs to the computer, wander in the other room to watch on the monitor, see how our, our job was going through the queue, and then go back to the counter to get our printouts. Um, Submitting our jobs, you ask. Yes. Um, we had to enter all this stuff on punched cards. Um, and uh, even a, a reasonably small chip would have um, at least two boxes of cards, which all had to be in the right order. We color coded them. All the metal layer things were on blue cards, all the polysilicon on red cards and stuff. But still, it was a lot of stuff to lug around. Um, and we were using a language called PAL, Precision Artwork Language. Um, you could say, select this size reticle, OK, move it around here on the film, OK, change to the next, move it around. Um, so it was very, um, very archaic tools we were using to, to build these chips. And then we can get the plots. Uh, the campus had a small uh, uh, black and white plotter. Uh, but to get the big plots, we had to go up to JPL and use their, their plotter there. Now, they were busy during the day, so we'd have to go up there at night. Um, Many nights, I'd go up to JPL at 10 o'clock carrying a mag tape and leave around 2 or 3 in the morning with a mag tape and a plot. And then we could see what we were doing. Um, one of the little known side effects of those plots is that the stepping motor in the plotter would play a different tone depending upon what angle the lines were drawing. And for most of it, most of the chip, it's just random stuff going every which way. But when you're getting to the core of the chip, repeated cells going over and over again, it's playing little tunes. So you'd know where you were in the plot by what tune it's playing. And um, being there many hours late at night hearing those tunes, those tunes are still rattling around in my brain. Um, sadly, none of those tunes became big hits. So I don't know. Uh, when we were satisfied with the plots, we would send the mag tape to a company in Anaheim that would plot them out on a Gerber plotter uh, onto film. And then they would make color keys of those layer, uh, those masks, and we could put them together and see our stuff. Um, we were making our own stained glass windows. They look real pretty. Um, but 
uh, one time we were getting ready to tape out our chip and the Gerber plotter wasn't working. So we threw a oscilloscope and other tools in the back of a van, drove out there, and we fixed their machine. And then they could make our, our chip for us. Uh, so that was kind of nice. We were getting ready to tape out one chip. And I entered Carver's office. But he was just staring at the ceiling, mumbling something about an engineer at Intel. Um, I asked what was up. And he replied, I'm trying to think of a good limerick for our chip. <laughs> While each of those words individually made sense, all of those <laughs> words together didn't. Huh? Well, he explained it. We were getting our chips fabbed as a favor. And um, uh, our chips had real low priority. So when they had spare time on the fab lines, usually late at night, they might run our chips through the next step. And it would take quite a while to get all this stuff done. But Carver figured out that if we put a limerick on the chip with one line of the limerick on each mask layer, <laughs> the ladies who were examining the chips after each run would see that. And they would push our runs through quicker to see what it said. And um, usually, the, the chips would take a couple of months to get back. We got them back in less than two weeks <laughs> if we had a limerick on there. So he was, he was looking for a limerick this one particular time. And, and I had just heard one, so I told it to him. And, and he liked it. It was, there once was a man of Spokane whose verses would never scan. When told this was so, he said, yes, I know. But I always try to get as many words in the last line as I possibly can. <laughs> So we used that, even though that last line sort of wrapped around the chip <laughs> that we were building. Um, now, there's one thing I learned from Carver at this time that really stuck with me. Have you ever seen Carver walk up a flight of stairs? Um, he just dashes up and down. Most people go really slow, either because it's more work or more dangerous. But not for Carver. He speeds up on the stairs. And so after all these years, I'm still doing that, um, going much faster than his wise were practical up and down stairs. Um, as the next year passed, we had a tremendous leap in technology called RJE, um, remote job entry. Rather than lugging these boxes of cards around and submitting them and, and dropping them and then sorting them, um, we could enter our designs uh, as a text file on the DEC system 20, RJE it in, and it would go into the 360 and it would run. And so that was, that was tremendous. Plus. Um, having the files there in a much more easily editable format. One day, we were submitting 100 spice runs. We were trying to model some stuff. And um, the good old 360 would estimate how long each job would take and then stick it into a job queue based on how long it was expected to take. And it correctly uh, assumed that these spice runs would each take about five minutes. So it merrily filled up the five-minute queue with our 100 jobs. So all of the people with 10-minute jobs were going to have to wait about eight and a half hours to get their result out of the computer, because ours went first. That was unanticipated and had dire consequences. So I quickly slipped out of the building and um, later came back and picked up all my results. Now, I know Carver took heat for that, but he never let on. And uh, that's why we have friends in high places, right? Take care of stuff like that. The chip we were working on at the time this is the second version of it. But we were working on a machine called Our Machine. And we called it Our Machine because, well, it was Our Machine. <laughs> and um, I was primarily working on the arithmetic logic unit and the barrel shifter. Other people were working on the memory array, control logics. Other people were working more at the register and algorithmic level, trying to decide what's the best uh, way to design this chip so that it could maximize the usefulness of what we were building. Um, so it was a lot of fun building that. The fledgling computer science department was having weekly meetings to talk about stuff. We talked about this lot, other things. Um, the meetings were called Lunch Bunch. And hey, for a while, there was free food. So that was very important. Um, but they were very stimulating discussions. And um, we would have presentations not only from people in our department, but from other departments as well. Chemistry would be in talking. Physics would be in talking about something. And um, I was really impressed with Carver at these. No matter who was speaking, no matter what the topic, he would have intelligent questions and would participate in the discussion. Um, he would understand what's going on. And um, it was actually very overwhelming to, to see him in those circumstances, to just the breadth of, of what he knew. OK, I'll, I'll say two more things to embarrass Carver, and then I'll get back onto my stuff. Um, one is uh, Carver's a very encouraging person. A lot of people. Um, I've met tend to put other people down, professors, other students, put other people down to build themselves up. 
Um, there are those who lift people up, and Carver is one of those uplifters. It's a real joy uh, working with him. I'm sure you know that. The second thing I'll say is Carver's a very humble person. Um, one example of that is the first paper I published, um, his name was on top and then my name, and that helped get the paper seen. The second paper, he put my name on the top and then his name second. And then after that, he would only put his name on if he had a significant contribution to the paper. A um, few years after graduation, I met up with a friend John, who was a professor up at uh, Berkeley, and we were talking about that, and he said, that's not how it's done there. Um, the professors get their name at the top of every paper no matter what, whether or not they actually ever saw any of the work. So um, that was just something that really, uh, again, stuck with me too about Carver. Uh, Carver wrote a book about VLSI design, and he asked my help on a couple of the chapters. Um, dealing with this chip, this is the version two of that, our machine uh, chip and the controller chip. We'd fly up to Palo Alto, work on the, the book using the Alto computers at Xerox Park. Um, it was a neat time. We met some really great people there uh, and so on. There was one incident that happened that was kind of funny. Um, Park was Xerox's top secret think tank area. So we had badges when we went in that said we could go in, but we had to be monitored and supervised and escorted the whole time we were there on the premise. Um, I was up there one weekend working on part of the book, and my wife was with me, and um, I needed to get in and work on this book. But uh, the, the people in our, our group were supposed to leave special instructions with the guard so that I could get in and work on stuff on the weekend. The guard could not find those special instructions. We were looking all over the place, more than half an hour working away there. He just would not let me in without that. Um, finally, he did find my name on the log, but the special instructions weren't there. So yes, I could get in, but I had to be escorted. Um, so the guard gave me the must be supervised badge, but then he gave Janet the all access badge so that she could escort me around. <laughs> Back to the chip design stuff, we were designing more complicated chips, and the PAL system just was not up to, to dealing with what we're doing. So in addition to building the chips, we're building the tools to build the chips. And uh, the computer science department had started a program called the Silicon Structures Project, or the SSP. It was a partnership between Caltech and various companies. They were working on uh, several tools um, and techniques associated with chip design. Uh, most of the work that Carver and I were doing were under his ONR grant, so we were kind of peripheral to SSP for some of the stuff we were doing, but we were part of SSP for part of it. Um, but I had finished this chip here. Um, it mostly worked. Um, it was just about completely flawless. The problem was this was so big we couldn't plot it on one plot, so I had to plot it on five different pieces. The central core was one piece, then the lower control and pads was another piece, and the upper and stuff. And we taped the plots together. And in taping those plots together, we didn't notice that six of the little lines down here missed by a micron. And that little micron shorted half the control bits coming into the chip to ground. <laughs> so that was, that was unfortunate, but no worries. Uh, Carver had a contact at TRW. They had a lab there with laser in it and we could burn away the bits of metal that were shorting it out, and we'd get a functional chip. So uh, that was pretty nice. Went down there, they showed me the microscope, okay. And they gave me brief instructions, and I was doing it. Put the chip under there, get the reticle lined up right where we wanted it to go. Now there was the control for the laser. Had a knob that went from zero to 999 and a little button. So I thought, being the efficient computer science person, I'd do a binary search to figure out what the right setting was. <laughs> so I set it to 500, hit the button, um, shattered pieces of chip and package were flung throughout the room. <laughs> so I found the engineer and said, hey, by the way, what setting do you use? And he said, oh, usually I start around 10. <laughs> so the other interesting part of that was um, uh, bonding those chips because we would get just the die back and we'd have to glue them into the package and bond them with little gold bonding wires. Most of our chips only had 20 pads, so okay, that's not that. This thing had 64 pads, so it took more than an hour, and you had to kind of coax the gold lines to kind of snake around each other without touching and melding and all kinds of stuff. So it, was, it took a while. So you have to do all that, then you have to burn the lines. And, but um, it was fun. The, the chip, after I, I zapped those metal things, the chip worked, and it was great. Um, but we said, you know, we don't want to have that problem again. And so the next chip where I was working on, um, 
I added a little bit of information to the, the chip design itself, little connection points on the peripheral of the cells that would say where things are supposed to connect. And the tool could then verify that the connection points lined up and things were connecting. And more than that, um, when we're doing the, the routing around the whole chip, um, the program would go and say, well, where is that thing? And it would draw the lines itself. So I wrote a program to do the, the routing of the lines. And then, well, OK, that control logic was pretty regular and, and easy, but uh, tedious and error prone. So wrote a program to do that. And then the buffers above that wrote a little program to do that. Um, and, and, and all that. I was uh, working away on this stuff, and, and Carver came by one day, and he said, hey, what are you doing? You know, I, you're, you're getting a whole chip done here by, by program. He instantly grasped that that was the right way to be designing chips. And so from then on, we started calling what we're doing silicon compilation. And the program uh, that we used was called Bristleblocks. And that's what we were building. As I was getting close to graduation, Carver approached me and said, you know, we should start a company to do this stuff. He didn't want to bother me until I was close to graduation. So he said, hey, let's do this. A week later, we met with some uh, people from a venture capital firm at a uh, restaurant at the Burbank Airport. Um, we made our business plans on the back of some napkins. And those became our napkin notes uh, for our company. Um, now, our company, this is the, um, this is the first chip. This is the, the first Ethernet controller chip that we built. And it was sort of half by hand and half by tools as we were building these tools. Um, but we had some experienced chip designers who were also techers and some software people and a president that we borrowed from the VCs. Our biggest difficulty the first couple of years um, was convincing the chip designers that our tool, which we're calling Genesil, could actually produce chips. Uh, because they could always do things better by hand. And so we're trying to tell them that no, that, that maybe these programs actually could do some of this stuff. When we were interviewing one designer, he looked at this plot from Brist Bristleblocks up on the wall, and he stared at it for a minute. And he said, you know, I could do a better job right here in that cell. <laughs> um, I pointed out, yeah, but it would take you half a year to get to that point of, of designing that on the chip. And Bristleblocks did this in 15 minutes. Um, and uh, sometimes, sometimes they would get it, and, and sometimes they just wouldn't. Um, a couple of years into the Genesil uh, experience, we had a customer come in and evaluate the tool. They used it for a couple of days, and they said, you know, we've been designing a chip for over half a year, and we still have a couple of months to go. Um, but we've, we came in here to your place, and we've used Genesil for two days now, and we've finished the design of the chip. And it's actually smaller and faster than what we were designing by hand. Um, I attribute that success to two things. First of all, they were optimizing at the wrong level. They, they spent all their time optimizing down at the little gate level, and they were missing the fact that they're not optimizing all the registers and the buses and the, the various units. And the other problem is, as they're going through their design process, they're learning things. Um, and so, hey, if they were to redo it, they could do a much better job. But they've invested half a year. It would take too long to redo it, um, so they couldn't. But with a tool like the compiler, they, they could. They could uh, rebuild and redo things. Now, we didn't do everything right. Uh, here's another chip. This is the Microvax chip. This is the first chip that was actually built completely by our tool. Um, and so, yeah, it was the first uh, Vax on a, on a chip. But tool called Genesil. And um, uh, after the first year, we returned our loaner president and went and hired a real one. Uh, he had a very forceful personality, but didn't know what he was talking about. No, that's not what I meant to say. Um, <laughs> But he insisted that our Genesil product have a form-based interface. Really? Forms? OK, you're going to design a chip by filling out forms, hundreds of forms. <laughs> the control logic in a form. OK, and this, the, the left part of the screen there, this is that form. Um, uh, and uh, we fought that, but we lost. Uh, in the end, though, Genesil actually won an industry award for our human interface. Um, Sadly, it was an award for having the worst human interface. <laughs> um, but there you go. But one day, I was walking down the hall with Carver. And I mentioned that I wanted to add a feature to Genesil where we could generate a little block diagram. You know, OK, fine, we use the form to enter it. But you could get a block diagram of what you're building. He turned as white as a sheet. He pulled me into a conference room. And he said, have you told anybody about this? And I said, no. And he said, don't. Just go do it. 
If you tell anybody about it, they'll form a committee to decide what color lines to use for drawing the plot. <laughs> so I thought he was overreacting a bit, but I humored him. Okay, fine, and, and I put it in. About a week later, it was in the tool, and actually that's this plot down here. This is one of these block diagram plots. Um, and it helped out a lot. Uh, it really made things, things a lot better, but about two days after we had this in there, it was, everything was fine, somebody came up to me and said, Dave, you're using red and green lines here. I really think you should have used red and blue. <laughs> so once again, Carver was right. Um, huh, I'm almost done here. Our company was having its annual shareholder meeting and there were about 500 people there. And, and so I was going to the meeting and I was wearing the only suit I had at the time, which was this brown suit. My boss, at the time, took me aside and he said, well, what was I doing in a brown suit? <laughs> no one wears a brown suit. The only proper colors are charcoal gray, navy blue, and black. Anyone who wants to get ahead in business wears navy blue, charcoal gray, or black. Um, I said, well, I don't have that. I have a leisure suit. Would that help? Um, <laughs> and uh, he was shocked. He said that was even worse than the brown suit. Um, he bought me the book, Dress for Success, <laughs> which I haven't quite gotten around to reading yet. <laughs> But um, there was that. And, and we got to the meeting. And yes, it was 500 people. And he was mostly right. Almost everybody there was wearing charcoal gray or navy blue or black suits. Um, there were two people there who were wearing brown leisure suits, Carver and Gordon Bell. <laughs> so. So that first company did well, it grew, it was acquired by other companies, and finally was itself acquired. And I found, my, found myself buried, a cog in a very big and very slow machine. So a friend and I left Minter Graphics, and along with Carver, we started a second company, Plan Beta Research, which became Celerity, which was then acquired by ViewLogic, which was then bought by Synopsys. And, and things went well all along the way, but, but then we were bought by Synopsys. And let's see, oh. Ah, no wonder I was in one paragraph missing. The work we were doing got noticed. And um, uh, this is an article about Carver. It appeared in Forbes magazine. And as I recall, in one televised speech, the president held up that magazine and referred to the article, too, which was kind of a, kind of a nifty deal. So, uh, so that was fun. And um, so anyway, as, as I was leaving Synopsys, for the same reasons leaving, leaving Mentor Graphics, um, I was told in very clear terms that I had to leave the industry for seven years due to all the non-complete, non-compete clauses and stuff. So, um, so I did, and I actually was starting a Skunk Works that was building technologies we would need to build our next generation of tool. Um, but then the dot-com fiasco came, and uh, that sort of ended our uh, our plans for doing that uh, that little project. But those were amazing years, and it was a great adventure, and it was led by a really great friend and a mentor. So thank you very much, Carver, and happy birthday. Can you get the OM uh, yeah, back yeah. up? Um, that's it. Dave, uh, do you have a pointer? Does anybody have uh, a pointer? There's still a little mouse in here. Oh, there's a the mouse there. Uh, why, uh, why don't you point to the? Carver, you want to There's a laser. Too. I'm sorry. I have one. Oh, good. Good, good. Thanks, Jamil. Um, this uh, this is a uh, you know this is a bunch of registers here. This is a barrel shifter here, and this is the arithmetic logic unit that Dave was talking about. And Dave always had uh, very clever ways of of, of naming things. So uh, the, the way these these things all worked is that these are all identical units, and then at the top. Uh, the the control lines come out, and then there were there were buffers that drove the control lines. So of course uh, these were the buffers that drove the control lines in the arithmetic logic unit. So Dave said called them of course buffalo. <laughs> uh, uh, then uh, he in, as he was inventing these tools, one of the problems we had was uh, you, you get all these wires that were going to go out to the pads, and then it would turn out that it really you can't see it on this one very well, but on some chips, there just weren't enough pads, not enough room for pads on one edge, and all the wires wanted to go there. And so you had to move the pads around and reroute it and everything. And so Dave 
made a special tool that would actually readjust the kind of rotate the pads around. So of course that was a roto router. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, so so Dave had done a lot of of uh, uh, creative um, uh, naming uh, as well as a lot of. And the other thing I'd like to say, Dave mentioned that we had to debug the Gerber plotter that was going to. So here we were making a VLSI chip, right? And uh, sitting on the floor of this uh, reasonably dingy little space down in, in, where was it? In I thought it was Anaheim somewhere. It might, might have been. It's yeah. south here. Down there, yeah. And, um, and here we were, the two of us, sitting on the floor with our scope and so forth. Uh, cards on the extender, and the cards have had discrete transistors on them. <laughs> so we were using three generations old technology to do the next generation technology. And that's a lesson that you learn all the time, is that, that if you're doing something new, you're always doing it with the old tools, or the old thought processes, or the old languages, or whatever. And that persists no matter what you're doing. So. Anyway, thanks very much, Dave. Uh, yeah.